So welcome back to chapter one. This is part two of our lecture. Um, we're going to talk about four different theories of motivation, um, and they are all related to organizational theory. Our first one is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This has been studied in psychology, law, business, sociology, marketing, and education. It kind of looks at five different needs in higher, in higher and lower orders with respect to their actual relevance. We look at the, what are physiological needs, what are safety needs, what are social needs, um, what are esteem needs, and what are self-actualization needs as well. It's important in business and psychology. The stages are listed on your right, but I want you to know that it's not, it's not a top-down, it's a bottom-up hierarchy. You have to have physiological needs to be able to get security, security to get social, social to get esteem, and esteem to get self-actualization. Maslow's argument was you can't move another step up the pyramid without the guarantee of the preceding level. So, briefly going over what each of these are. Your physiological needs are food, clothing, shelter. They're essential for your general survival. Security is prevention of physical and mental, um, and mental problems. Physiological and security are required legally at the federal level that schools must provide them. Maslow, relating to business, really says the manager has to provide those two needs to their employees. Same with schools. Maslow is used to describe a manager's relationship with their employees, um, very common in business. McGregor concluded that a manager's view of nature is based on assumptions that people are either negative or people are either positive, and it was this notion of theory X and theory Y. Theory X is that employees hate work, and whenever possible, they will avoid work. Since they dislike it, you need to control them, and you need to punish them if they don't want to go to work. Employees avoid responsibilities and seek formal direction whenever possible, um, and most workers will place job security over all factors and will display ambition if they know they have job security. Theory Y is when employees view work as a natural part of life, and it can be as natural as rest or play. They have self-control if they're committed to the objectives. They want to seek responsibility, and they want to make innovative decisions, if at all possible. Two-factor theory was Herzberg. He basically said, what do people want from their jobs? And he came up with three specific things, even though it's two-factor theory. Um, he came up with three specific things that people want out of any job that they do. They want intrinsic factors, such as advancement, which leads to extrinsic factors, such as more pay, increased responsibility, and being satisfied with their position and their state within the company. McClellan's three needs theories is the need for achievement, the need for power, and the need for affiliation. For achievement, McClellan found that your high achievers differentiate themselves from others because they want to do better and they want to perform better it, it, whenever they possibly can. They want immediate feedback um, and they want challenging goals, but they are only going to perform best when they know that they're going to be successful. And there's nothing wrong with that. I, I think most people in our society want to perform best when they know that they have a chance to be successful. Power, these are the individuals that enjoy being in charge. They want to influence others. Um, they want to control others if they possibly can control others. Um, and they would rather be in status-oriented and competitive situations more than anything else. For affiliation, these are people that want um, a friendship and they want everybody to like them and they want everybody to get along with them. Yes, this is common in organizations and yes, there are people that exist that strive and they live their life for this is the most important thing for them. Um, but researchers haven't viewed this as that important because it's not something that's directly related to job responsibilities. We have some six modern theories of motivation. I'm going to talk about each one of these briefly. Cognitive evaluation theory is that if you do extrinsic rewards, more pay, um, more perks, more benefits, then people come to expect it and they don't want to do the job for it making them feel good. They do the job for rewards more than anything else. 
So if you're in a performance pay occupation, this can be a problem, especially for role expectations on who and what a manager is and what's expected of a manager and what they're supposed to do. Goal setting theory basically says when people set goals, they perform better at, common ta at particular tasks. They need to have external commitment from the organization, maybe from home, internal commitment from the organization as well, um, and good feedback. And if they get this, they're more likely to perform well as well. Um, I think this one is a common sense theory. People do better when they set goals. Maybe on your dissertation, you can relate this to strategic planning. Self-efficacy theory is this notion of social cognitive theory and social learning theory. Um, the higher your self-efficacy, the more confidence you have in your ability to succeed in a task. When a manager sets difficult goals for employees, it leads employees to set higher goals for their own performance. So if you give somebody higher goals, chances are they're going to rise to the occasion and do whatever they can in order to perform and be successful. Reinforcement theory would argue that behavior is environmentally caused. People will perform only based on the people around them. And this is the concept of functionalism that we're going to be speaking about later on in our class. Um, we don't care about the interstate of the individuals and even who they are as a person. They're only going to do work based on who their boss is and what their boss is telling them to do. This can create a problem and a challenge as well, especially if you're trying to motivate these individuals who really, quite honestly, don't care about what you have to say, and they care more about ways of just keeping their boss and management happy. Equity theory basically says that we have organizational justice. This is a perception of what's good and what's fair in the workplace, that pay should be equal across all domains. It doesn't matter what the job you're doing. It doesn't matter how much time you have in the organization, level of your education. It's that everybody's treated fairly and equally in the organization. Think about what you know about teachers. Is an art teacher paid the same as a math teacher? In most school districts, yes. Is a music teacher paid the same as a social studies teacher? Once again, in most school districts, yes. So this creates an issue in, in, in this difficult problem understanding equity theory because, you know, it's done on a school-wide level, but I would say, managerially, it's not common. Expectancy theory. Employees will work hard if they have three following things. They get a good performance appraisal. When they get a good performance appraisal, they get higher rewards, and the rewards satisfy their personal goals. Think about how you do performance appraisals um, in, your, in, in your school districts as school principals. Um, most workers do the minimum to get by, which is actually one of the reasons why the evaluation system in Tulsa Public Schools openly says 68% of teachers are all average, 16% are below average, and 16% are above average. Um, this creates a problem that nobody can really achieve these high goals and these high expectations, and that makes things a little more complicated. There's no universal pr principle for everybody's motivations. They're all different. But under expectancy theory, everybody's going for the performance appraisal, and it is what they care about. So relating this to something that I used when I was finishing my doctorate, it was this notion of panopticism in Foucault. Foucault basically said that life in everything is a building, and you are in a level that's in the center. In order to control people, you have eyes that are watching them at all times. There's security cameras. Um, different evaluations, different locks on doors, and people perform better when they have fear um, because you want people to perform better under fear. This really helped develop 1984 by Orwell, which further reinforced this concept. Um, the goal of the supervisor in, uh, uh, under Foucault would be really just to scare people more than actually help them and make them <laughs> love their job. We're doing it to basically, the human function is to scare people which, once again, you have to determine if you think that's an appropriate human function. I don't think it is, but there are some school districts that operate under that. So, this textbook is a good textbook for this class because this textbook is going to give you theories that you may or may not agree with, and that's why I like the book. Theories in this book are going to be, you're going to get probably 80 to 100 theories, and I'm guessing that you're going to hate most of them. But remember, the point of this class is to write your dissertation, meaning you are picking theories that actually make sense and hold value and relevance to you. So 
you need the context to describe the theories and explain them. And if they don't work for you, that's fine. They don't need to work for you. Um, you just need to know them and understand them. So critical theory is one that's very big in, uh, in school districts right now. We look at this, and some people will call this critical race theory. Uh, this came from Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the, of the Oppressed. This is the banking system where children were treated as empty beings, that some had knowledge, some didn't. Um, Jonathan Kozel wrote a book, Savage Inequalities. We're going to talk about this a little later in class, but it showed that students living in poverty were, you know, were in underfunded schools, and they didn't have good enough teachers to help them meet standards. So Savage Inequality says, students living in, living in poverty were in underfunded schools and with fewer highly qualified teachers, which led to a hint, a hindrance in meeting state and district standards. I would ask in class, let's argue why this is true. Every single person watching this knows this is true. Why is it true? Because individuals that are in these underfunded schools are looking probably to get out. Not a lot of them have a lot of organizational commitment to them. So how do you fix this? How do you fix this in education? You don't fix this in education, people. This is, this is a regular, common occurrence. And if you find a way to fix this, you're going to be a multi-billionaire not millionaire, and uh, you'll never have to work a day again in your life, and I will still be teaching because I will never find a way to fix this, and I don't expect to fix this. So critical race theory um, comes out of Gloria Ladson Billings. She's at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, and she really talks about the importance of the Afrocentric experience. Um, she's done a lot of work that relates sort of to the Black Lives Matter movement in schools, once again, remember the point of this class. Um, if this is something you disagree with, that's a million percent fine by me. You can agree with whatever you want, um, but Owens and Valesky don't share this experience or this perspective. But they say organizational theory is you looking at everything and finding out what will actually fit for you in your research. So if you are doing anything dealing with social justice, Critical race theory is a major component of your research, um, and it's definitely something that you at least want to consider looking at, because it is big in schools, and it's something that could one million percent impact the direction that your research goes in. So, Solorzano Sol in 1997 defined critical race theory, um, basically saying that you know we live in a society where our goals as educators is to eliminate racism and racial stereotypes from society, including policy and laws, which that's very, very, very controversial to say. So Decor and Dixon's five tenets of critical race theory telling you, you know, what it exists of. It, it, number one is counter storytelling, meaning people of color should be able to expose and critique normalized dialogues that perpetuate racial stereotypes. So they need to be the ones talking and they need to be the ones sharing their experiences. Um, the permanence of racism, you need to understand that racism exists and, it, and, and it's everywhere and it's not changing. Um, this is the big one right now in schools, is that whiteness itself is a, is a property and just the fact that you're white, you have an advantage over everybody. Um, it's the historical view saying that whites get everything. Um, everything that's given to a white person is handed to them, where people that are minorities have to work harder for it, and it doesn't matter. The importance of whiteness as property is it doesn't matter your your ranking or where you are, even if you're somebody that even if you're somebody that's working uh, working a menial job. Just the fact that you you are white, you have a better opportunity than somebody that's African American. Interest conversion, the, the decisions made by the majority only help people of color when it is in the interest of the majority. And the critique of liberalism, saying that society should be colorblind is a bad thing, that you need to discuss race and you need to put race in the forefront. Once again, it's important for me to, inf to, to stress to you that I am not promoting this theory. I would never write about critical race theory. This is not my research interest. This is not who I am as a person. I came from a very rich and very affluent school district. I grew up in poverty, but I taught in a rich school district. So my work doesn't reflect this. But if yours does, this could be a good fit for you as you continue to research. So social justice theory. Um, takes a step towards critical race theory in schools using social justice elements and frameworks. 
and this is something that's normally done in larger urban school districts. So organizational theory um, really is relevant to today's models of school leadership. Um, there's an increase of, of work of individuals who are doing functional educational research on organizations. I work, in mo I work with most of these people through ARA and, uh, and through the special interest groups. When society changes, this causes everything to change, um, but, not on, but it could be on a worldwide level as well, not at the national or state level. So vision and leadership in schools, if we were in class face-to-face um, -face right now, we would be talking about does this matter, does this mean anything? Um, my argument is that you know, your vision statement should be a goal, and the organization's vision statement should, should, be, it should be the goal for the entire organization. Um, once again, this is totally up to you to do what you want with mission and vision. Um, I have found in my experience that you know, most people don't know the mission statement for the building or for the district, um, and that creates a, a disconnect as well. So how do you set a vision for the school? What do our textbook authors say? They say that you need to consult lower levels, recognize the ability to lead, facilitate participation, engage different viewpoints, and demonstrate collegiality and share leadership when that is possible. So can you do this? And you know, my question has always been, do mission and vision statements make a difference? Do they matter? And if they do matter, what does them mattering exactly look like? Does it have a long-term effect on the organization, or is it going to change when somebody new comes in? That's something that you have to think about and something you have to consider. So our textbook talks a little bit about No Child Left Behind um, that really furthered this notion that there's a federal role of education in schools. You learn about this in your school reform class, um, but the goals of it are good goals. I mean, honestly, you're, we want to close the achievement gap for disadvantaged students. We want every classroom in America to have a highly qualified teacher, and we have closely monitored systems of accountability. These are great ideas. But it's important to note that No Child Left Behind says research 116 times, but it doesn't necessarily show specific research things. Um, I want to stress that the unintended consequences of No Child Left Behind are more important than what No Child Left Behind was. The unintended consequences of No Child Left Behind you, basically was this, was this idea that you know, we had more monitored systems of accountability for students, teachers, and schools. Um, even, though, even though research was involved, um, the operational definition of research is, is difficult to determine. So explaining education research, research has not been held high esteem traditionally in, in, in education. It's in context with other academics. The standard for research is that you actually have randomized selection and assigned participants to experimental and control groups. So here's the example that I always give in class. I have this great idea for a research study. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take 50 students that are in third grade in my building. I'm gonna find the absolute worst possible teacher that I can find that's horrible. Maybe, maybe, maybe comes, comes to work drunk every day, and I'm gonna put 25 of those kids with that drunk teacher. Then I'm gonna find the best teacher I can find. I'm gonna put 25 kids with those, with the great teacher. I'm going to see what happens. I'm going to count the number of discipline referrals. I'm going to count the number of times parents are coming. But that's good research, right? Well, technically, that's perfect research. But there are so many moral and ethical issues with that that make it horrible and make it wrong. And that's the problem. You need to make sure that the efforts that you're doing relate to the moral majority. And when you're dealing with students and when you're dealing with kids, you have to consider that. So. Once again, I give you that example. It's not legal, it's not ethical, I can't publish off of it, it means nothing. So, most educational research is case study research. It's perfect for organizational theory, it's what we look at. You don't have to do your dissertation as a case study, but we find that most dissertations in this field are truly case study based dissertations um, because of that. So, there are no overarching paradigms in education. Um, no Child Left Behind, Common Core, and Race to the Top were forces paradigms. They didn't fly. Education is still at the state and local level, but federal reactions are becoming more of a reality. 
We're going to talk more in this class about sociology and psychology. The next two chapters really look and relate to that in education. I only got about 30 seconds left, but I wanted you to get as much as you can. I'm hopeful you got something out of this chapter, and we're going to look at chapter 2 and chapter 3 in the next few weeks in class. Thank you.